get started with the painting, I want to follow basically the rules um, that we've established in class. Uh, big things first, general to specific, of course. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on the background right now. Uh, we will bring that in as needed. But mostly what we want to talk about are what are the biggest dark shapes. Let's establish those darks first and work our way towards the lights. Uh, so I want to focus in on these core shadows, these deep, darker portions, and then work my way slowly into the light out of that, pushing out of the shadow towards the lights as I, as I go. When I look at this one, I see two different things happening in the shadow. Um, one, there's very dark shadow, um, but I'm seeing that there is a redness to one part of the shadow and a coolness to another. So a warm part of the deep shadow and then a cooling of the shadow as it starts to turn into light before it becomes part of the light part, uh, the local value and color of her face, and then the highlight. So I'm gonna look for that warmer tone first for my deepest, darkest shadows. And what you're going to see me do for the largest portion of this is really just establish where these colors exist without a lot of manipulation. And I'm not going to try to blend my way out of this. Um, Definitely not going to be trying to make things perfect or detailed or anything like that. I'm just going to establish, I see a dark shape. It seems to be here. So it's very similar to what we were doing in the underpainting. Just establishing everywhere that I see that color. I'm using a fairly large brush. One of the things I think is a benefit of working with a larger brush than you think you need is that it keeps you from falling into the trap of trying to get caught up in the details. If I work with this big brush, it's kind of like a blunt weapon and I I can't do too much fine work with it. And since I don't want to be doing that level of detail at this point, then this helps me stay in that mindset of keeping things rather broad in the terms that I'm speaking in right now. You'll find if you work this way, that you can actually get pretty adept at controlling the larger brush. And that reduces your dependence on that feeling like you'd always need to go and use that really tiny brush. And what I see people doing really often is using that tiny brush to try to paint the entire thing. And I want to get big information down first. And right now I'm really just reinforcing this idea that I've separated the light shapes from the dark shapes. But I am giving some hue, um, some color to that as I do this. But I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. I really just want that dark to pull itself away from 
the light. Also, uh, you'll notice I'm not finishing this painting off at the bottom. That's that's a stylistic choice. Um, there's a lot of artists that do this. Richard Schmid um, has this whole following of people that have this kind of finished, unfinished appearance to their paintings. It works okay for us uh, and what we're doing in that the way people like to look at things, we look at the top half and if there's some empty or unfinished space down in the lower part, we don't notice quite so much. And we're taking advantage of that. Visual weight pulls away from that. I'm mixing a, a cooler version of this purple. So I went for white because it cooled it down. It also lightened it up a bit. And I grabbed a little bit of my grayish blue. I want to, as I come out of this shadow, I'm going to want to cool things down a bit. Again, really just looking for where does that color exist specifically. I don't want to spread one color too far across this whole thing. I don't want to bounce as much as we used to or we've been trained to do on other paintings. And the reason is each part of this portrait, each part of the figure that I'm looking at, is facing the light source in a slightly different fashion than any other part. And if light if light is what reveals color to our eye, then it makes sense at any time this color a little warmer lighter still anytime i'm looking at a new portion of the color a new location of a color it makes sense that that color is probably facing the light in a slightly different manner. If that's true, then it makes sense that I need to change colors pretty often. It may be very close in color. but it's probably not the same as that color. The other thing I'm trying to pay attention to as much as possible at this point is really where do I see that shift between warm and cool? Where does the color seem like it wants to tend towards the bluer side of the spectrum? Where does it seem like that color wants to go more red? Okay. Speaking of, you can see over here on the palette, I'm not reaching for these four as much. I will as needed, but mostly I'm 
grabbing from those pre-mixed colors as if those were the colors that came right out of the tube for me in this when as I first started working on this. Other thing, I'm trying to notice again, I'm not doing a lot of brushing. It's more kind of, I'm just pushing paint onto the canvas. It's almost like I'm pressing the paint into the canvas. And that's what I want to do. I'm not doing a ton of blending, not really doing any blending. I'm just creating these little patches of color. So I'm just pushing color in and leaving it alone. Your temptation is going to be to really want to put a lot of time and effort and energy into kind of blending right at the get-go. And I really want you to resist that urge. We want to put this together um, the way it was described to me, was as if we're putting little tiles of paint on here, like we're making this painting as a mosaic. So, um, mosaics don't blend together so much. You just lay the piece of color down. I guess that's a good way to think about it. You're putting pieces of color down. Right in the spot that you see it. And then as soon as you look away from that color and look to another spot, you're going to start looking for the next color. So you're going to be mixing constantly. You're going to end up with just a ton of little pieces of color all over the canvas. you put this together. So if it helps to think in terms of, um, oh, like a puzzle, you're just putting a little puzzle together. You're trying to find all the little pieces that make the puzzle. The other thing you want to be doing as you work is um, go ahead and keep making corrections to your initial drawing. Do you see that Something isn't quite in the right space still. Go ahead and make that correction. This is the time to do that. In fact, it's always the time to make better assumptions about what you've already seen, and what you've drawn. So we build this painting up 
in layers and pieces and layers and pieces, eventually you're going to get to a point where there's less and less of need for making those big adjustments happen. But for now, absolutely. Let the whole thing still be in flux. Let it change and develop as it goes. I don't have any medium out. Um, you could certainly be working with Some of your liquid, although you could pretty much do this whole phase of this painting without any medium. The only thing I used, and this was right at the very beginning, a little bit of mineral spirits on my brush to give that first couple things, a little bit of flow, um, but almost immediately I went to just pure paint. So I'm letting this painting have a bit of a thickness to it. Let me build. I'm going to build layers of paint on top as I go. I could load my brush a little bit heavier. Okay. Something a little smaller. Still, <coughs> at this point, I'm mostly thinking about the shadow. And while I'm in that mode, I am going to grab a smaller brush. I want to push in some of the darks that I see that are a little bit too small for that big brush to handle at this point. Sorry, got one of the school's laptops here and I'm having a heart attack thinking it's about to fall off the, the stand. And uh, I don't really want it to do that.
Okay, so establish those colors uh, in the shadows. Not too much detail in there, not a lot of focus on that. The, the way you want to handle this is if you want to get your viewer to pay attention to the light striking the face, then you want to really put the, the color play and the effect of what you're doing into that section. And you want to just kind of leave the shadows fairly simple early on. Um, now, if the shadows are the most interesting part of what you're trying to paint, then you want to do the opposite. And that means, that means follow the shadows and find all the really subtle things and differences in color inside the shadows and leave the, the lighter part fairly plain. But for most of us, usually the way we're looking at a portrait, we're really looking for what's going on inside the lights. So now, as I grow out of these shadows into the lighter parts of the form, I'm going to hang out kind of just in one little space and really concentrate on how do we get out of the shadow? How does the form turn back towards the light? What happens there? What colors do I see? And put that patchwork of colors into the painting. You might notice when I'm mixing color, a lot of times I steal from my neighbor. I've got all these little puddles going now. And so rather than feel like every time I need a new color, I need to go back to 
these four or even these first few, if I just need to change something slightly, there's a lot of colors right around there that I might grab a little paint from and see if it doesn't work in the space I'm trying to solve. Doesn't always work, but Fairly often I find that the color I'm looking for exists in the combination of two that are already been mixed right there. And so if you remember from the very beginning I was talking about how these colors on the palette already have a, a fairly um, high intensity compared to most flesh colors. I'm looking for mixtures of these to reduce their intensity as I find the colors that I'm looking for. And that reduction of intensity comes from pulling from the colors right around each other. So you'll see me quite a bit just reaching for little brushfuls of the colors right next to what I'm working with. I'm finding a lot of cool colors in this side of her face. And overall, I feel like this is a, going to be a fairly cool skin toned painting. Um, so I'm not working out of these really warm colors as much as you might expect. The ones that feel like they're already kind of in that fleshy color range. But I am stealing from those to find some of these cooler colors and I'm always looking for that excuse to push the difference between warm and cool. Every time I see a new space, I'm comparing it to the spaces around it. Is this warmer or cooler than the shapes sitting right next to it? It's warmer by how much? How do I find that color and make it happen? But for now, I'm just finding just a lot of greens and blues want to be involved in these spaces and so I'm that's the the range I'm playing in if I see that opportunity to pop that little bit of a warmer or more intense color, I'm going to do that because that variety of temperature and variety of color is what's going to give this a lively feel instead of this overworked kind of feel. Again, I'm not Blending, I'm just establishing spaces where I see things happening. Also not super concerned with 
how accurate I'm being. I am trying to match the colors that I see as best I can, um, but it takes a little bit of time and work before the, all the colors start to show up and show you where they need to be. And so until I really feel like I've got a good collection of colors going, I can't start making really specific color judgments about whether or not I've got the right color in the right spot. So each time I'm just trying to be um, close to the right color. Make the best guess that I can at this point in the painting. Often when we're working on our painting, um, we find that it gets to a, you know, I, I hear you all say it, oh, it, I have to let it dry, I got too much paint, got too sloppy, so I have to let it dry for a while before I can do much more to it. And that, that does happen. Um, but this way of working that I'm trying to show you now, where we're not blending or anything like that, we're just laying in these colors. We don't have much medium in the paint. This allows for you to build colors on top of each other um, fairly easily. I'm not laying down really thick chunks of paint. Um, paint's actually fairly thin. But I, because I'm not working it and working it and working it as I work on the painting, the paint just sits there. And then as I start to put a new color into a space, It can sit right on top of the other application without getting all muddied up or mixing into each other and causing me heartache. So as I push on this, as I bring these colors in, I want to keep looking for that relationship. Where does it go warmer? Where does it go cooler? 
There's not a lot of value change in this whole cheek over here, but there are a lot of subtle places where the temperature wants to change. And that's the part I really want to concentrate on and bring out is where does it seem to go more towards that pink version? Or does it want to go towards that orange version of the flesh tones? Where does it want to cool off into the greens? Or even blues and purples? Eventually what happens is on the palette, you realize you're just running out of space. At some point you might clean it off, but I would use the whole space up before I would get, whoops, too interested in that. Um, I find a lot of times the color I'm looking for, it's somewhere on there. I have to deal with that mistake even a little bit. Um, the color I'm looking for exists somewhere on the palette or a variation of it. So rather than scrape all of this off, um, I'll start making modifications to the colors that are already on here. So changing these puddles making them more useful to me at this point. And so the more I see, the more information I have, the easier a lot of this will get. So I'm getting more accurate information than I had when I first started. Hopefully you can see that that underpainting is serving me sort of sort of following it. I am making adjustments if I see that it's not quite right accurate um, but the lines the construction lines you can see this line right here it looks like she's crying right now um, as I build these layers of color on top all that stuff goes away and that's why I don't worry about trying to finagle perfection out of that first excuse me stage because I know I'm going to be able to cover all that stuff up. I'm going to be building this painting out of layers and layers and layers of color. I'm going to make more than one pass of the whole thing. And so if that's the case, then I'm not too concerned about those early lines.
so obviously this is going to take a lot longer, a lot more work as I build this painting up. And I'm not going to keep talking at you while, while that happens. Um, but I wanted you to get a sense of how to get started with the color. You are going to continue this process for quite a while. Just looking for patches of color, not falling into the temptation of trying to finish the painting or the temptation to get pieces of the painting to look just right, right off the bat. That just never works. And well, I know it's one of our strong habits when we paint. It's probably one of our worst habits that most of us have is that desire to try and make this look right right now instead of letting it develop giving into the process that painting really is and so if i sound like a broken record that's fine it is the kind of thing that this takes The keys here, to kind of recap a little bit, you need to be looking for warm versus cool and what is the value. So you're trying to decipher and pull colors out of this painting or out of this photograph, I should say. You're trying to see as many colors in that flesh as you can. The more colors you see, the more energetic and vibrant the painting will tend to be in the end. And that's really where the kind of liveliness of the painting will come from, is that sense of that there's blood coursing through this person's veins, that blood is pooling in some areas more than others, that it's creating warmth and redness or orangeness to the skin and other places are cooling off and going more pale and to the greens and blues and purples. And that the combination of the two is really what this person's flesh is probably going to be all about. That was a big mistake right there so I'll need to clean my brush and my palette because I just forgot that I had black on my on my brush when I did that um, as far as the background goes and I'll give you this now and then you'll be able to get going on your painting um, it exists its sole purpose here is to support the foreground. We said that when we were doing the initial drawing. And so anything I do back here, the consideration for it, the reason why I would make anything happen is simply because that is going to help the foreground do its thing even better. Now, one of our rules we've had all semester is background to foreground, and this is certainly breaking that rule. But I am using this color back here at this point almost as a way to compare some of the colors I see in here. And if you remember what we learned about um, color interaction in the last couple of assignments in painting one, the color mixing and the color matching assignments, 
when I lay in this big patch of this kind of grayish color back here, the colors in the flesh are going to start to come even more alive, especially because this is a really very neutral, fairly cold gray that I'm laying in back here. It's going to have a tendency to make those warmer tones want to pop out and she's going to become even more vibrant as a result, more lively, more life-like. And so a big part of pushing this in at this point is to let some of that chroma, some of that color play in here really start to become the star of the show and stand out as opposed to what's going on in the background. So notice some of the things I didn't play around with today. I did a little bit around the, the mouth and the lips, but not much. A little bit around the nose, but not much. And barely even address the eyes. It's more I was dealing with eyelids in the space around the eye itself and not getting into this. I will show you how to do that, but we really don't want to tackle those things this early in the painting because we get caught up in that detail and we forget everything else that we're trying to achieve. Um, many, many times the successful painting of the eyes really is about painting everything that's around them instead of trying to paint that perfect eyeball. And so I don't want to get into that until I get closer to the end of the painting. I want to sneak up on it, so to speak, and try to find the solution to that as I go. So don't do the details now. You know you're going to get to it. It will happen later in the painting. Just let that let your bouncing around and looking for colors and the rest of it lead you into those pieces of the eyes, the lips, the teeth, anything along those lines. And you'll be a lot happier for having done it that way.